I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to The Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Dean Detloff, a PhD student at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto. I'm Matt Bernico. I teach media studies at Greenville University in Greenville, Illinois. And this week, we're both big city boys. We sure are. Usually it's just one big city boy and one rural farm college boy. But this week, it's two big city boys. We're both at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto recording together. For the first time together here, anyway. In this building, specifically. This yeah, it's cool. Uh, I gave a talk at the Institute for Christian Studies today, and it was really fun. And people asked me questions I didn't know how to answer, and <laughs> that was a wild time. And then they bought me lunch. You did a good job trying. The lunch, <laughs> the lunch stipend is a good reward. The lunch stipend is the best reward. <laughs> uh, that talk will be a podcast with the ICS podcast, Critical Faith, later on. Way later. When yeah, I get we'll, a chance uh, to do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll retweet it or whatever later. Yeah. That was uh, cool, though. It was a good opportunity. Yeah, I think it was fun. People seem to be into it. Yeah. That's a good thing. So Matt talked about decolonizing Christian education, and I like it here at ICS because we think really hard about weird ways of experimenting with Christian education, and I don't think that we've really done decolonization its due diligence or our due diligence on it. So it's cool to like bring up that conversation. People are talking about it, and I'm curious to see if it goes anywhere. That would be nice. Yeah, I mean, you guys haven't. No one has. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. It's kind of a bummer, but yeah. it's like a thing that's just not really happened yet. Yeah, I mean, like, it makes sense. It hasn't reached sort of critical mass of uh, a thing that people talk about. Right. Until now. Yeah. So that's cool. Uh, <laughs> look out for that. Um, but yeah, we've been we've been doing all kinds of fun stuff. What's your favorite so far, Matt? Toronto impression, Toronto activity. Oh, man, we've done so much stuff. Um my uh, wife and child are here too, so we've been doing lots of fun kid stuff. We went to the science center and saw some, I don't know, science. science. I guess a lot of science there, tons of it. <laughs> uh, oh, we went to the ROM as well and saw some, some dino bones. That was good. A lot of science. Saw some mummies. Saw some mummies. There were these little kids that were looking at the mummy, and there was like a hole in the mummy's head, and they were like, whoa, I see the brain. <laughs> That's Love good, that. Those are good kids. The kids are all right. They are all right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I also love, so Matt's, uh, Matt's wife, Shannon, it's really into Gilmore Girls, and so is uh, my wife, my partner, Emily, also into the Gilmore Girls, and I didn't know this until Shannon told me, but apparently they filmed the Gilmore Girls pilot not far from Toronto, so we wanted a, a nice field trip. Um, we went to Gilmore Girls World, saw all the, all the best rides, <laughs> had some coffee. It's just like a really tiny town, and we saw the place where Luke's Diner was filmed. It's a spa now, which I love. Yeah. It's really funny. I mean, Dean and I were there, and it was like it was a very fun trip. My wife was so excited about them. <laughs> she was just like losing, losing she was her losing mind. It. I love that. In a great way. Yep. <laughs> so that was good. Yeah, I heard next year, though, they're going to give VR rides. Yeah, I think so. Next year, it'll be like Westworld, but Gilmore Girls. Yeah. And like Luke will chase you around. Ooh, sp spooky Luke. That's what Luke's known for in the show. He's always out to get you. <laughs> <laughs> At spooky Luke's diner. <laughs> you don't want to go there after midnight. Uh, yeah, so that was good. <laughs> that, that was a good thing. Um, we're really drawing this out because we don't have any iTunes reviews. So if you're upset about it, it's your own fault. You should have made one up. Uh, yeah, so this week um, is the 52nd episode of Magnificast. Which is a good is a good one. I mean, really, from here on out, every week is a milestone, and we're going to treat it like it is. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so the the cool thing about fifty two is that's also how many weeks are in 
a year. Calendar year. A, one calendar year in the in the Gregorian calendar. Gregory's calendar. <laughs> Greg. Greg time. <laughs> so this is uh, the official one year podcast, but it's not really official because we we did like half episodes for a minute. Anyways, we decided for the 52nd episode in this monumentous occasion, we would circle all the way back around to episode one and talk about Jacques Ellul's Anarchy and Christianity again. Uh, it seemed like a good opportunity since you can't really even hear the first one because it's so quiet because we are not people who knew how to do anything. Um, <laughs> but now we do, and uh, we're going to talk about Jacques Ellul and Anarchy and Christianity, the book, because it's fun and interesting, and uh, we still have a lot of really critical things to say about it. So Yeah, it was fun to revisit it now after thinking for a year about Christianity and the left a little more intentionally and trying to interview people and get their thoughts and, and talking to like other Christian anarchists and all that. Uh, I think we've got some good things to draw from now. Yeah, I think so. Um, definitely way more thankful for the other Christian anarchists <laughs> in my life right now after reading this. Yeah, uh, that's one thing this book is very good for. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Well, uh, I guess a little bit of contextualization. So in episode one, um, we made the point that this is the book uh, that really got us into the idea of Christianity and leftist politics or being like someone who is a leftist. Uh, I think at the time we were both anarchists or whatever. Um, but this is the book that kind of started it all for us. So we're revisiting it again and now again. Um, <laughs> but it's pretty cool. So we're going to uh, it's pretty cool and also pretty dumb in a lot of other ways. But um, we're going to kind of work through a little bit of it together and uh, we'll we'll talk through it. And we'll talk about maybe, I guess, why it's important for us or why it's not important for us any longer at the end. But um, for now, we're just going to take a look at some of the fun stuff in the book. Yeah, there's a lot going on. It's a short book, but so many things happen in it. <laughs> <laughs> so many sweeping claims. <laughs> okay, so instead of starting chronologically, like from the beginning of the book and then moving back, we're just getting all loosey-goosey. And uh, going to pull out the themes of the book that we think are important, and then kind of jump around a lot. So if you're following, I like to call it a slippery hermeneutics, Lucy hermeneutics, <laughs> Lucy Lucy hermeneutics. <laughs> uh, we'll make sure we put we say the page numbers though, so when you're following along at home, inevitably you can just like skip around with us. No one does that. I say it all the time. <laughs> I, I do it when I edit it. Oh, just, oh yeah, good. Yeah, just to make sure. Yeah, I definitely believe that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the very first thing that uh, we're going to pull out uh, of Jacques Ellul's Anarchy and Christianity is, I think, the part that makes him the most anarchist, and then we'll kind of move back to the things that make him just incredibly strange. So um, <laughs> on page 22 and 23 of the book, he gets into a bit of uh, his sort of philosophy of power and the relationship between power and anarchism. Obviously, these are the kinds of things that anarchists actually care about, and uh, the views represented by Alul here, are, I think, are pretty characteristic of what most anarchists think. Or at, at least a lot of them. At least a lot of them, yeah. Um, okay, so he says this. Um, in anarchy, there's no possibility of rerouting into a reinforcement of power. This took place in Marxism. The very idea of a dictatorship of the proletariat presupposed power over the rest of society. Nor is it simply a matter of the power of the majority over the minority instead of the reverse. The real question is that of power of some people over others. Unfortunately, as I have said, I do not think that we can truly prevent this, but we can struggle against it. We can organize on the fringe. We can organize on the fringe. We can denounce not merely the abuses of power, but power itself. Only anarchy says this and wants it. So, Dean, what do you think about this? Is this characteristic of anarchists? <laughs> is this normal? Uh. I mean, I'm sure you could find loads of anarchists who actually think a lot about power and in ways that aren't totally negative or in ways that are more interesting. But I think that it's true that he represents a certain subset of anarchist discourse that is all about eschewing power in every at every turn. Um, so, yeah, I guess I wouldn't make a little into a mouthpiece for anarchism writ large, but he's certainly a person who talks a lot about power in a way that anarchists do and especially a way that Christian anarchists do. Yeah, I think that you're right. Um, there's, like, I think, some similarities here between uh, Alul and something like Bakunin, maybe. Um, the idea that you should absolutely reject state power, you should reject power at every turn, that that's kind of the problem. It's not, um, the problem isn't fundamentally capitalism or the state, it's power. And if you cut that off and stop exercising power, then um, you could sort of do anarchy. Right. And I think there's also something to it um, something to the power discussion that's interesting where anarchists um, are really nervous about building mass movements that could turn into another oppressive force, right? That's something that they're always trying to fight against. 
And one way of naming that is by calling it power. Mm -hmm. Um, There are loads of other reasons to think about power or to think about destroying abuses of power, that sort of thing. But to get rid of power altogether is like a really strong philosophical and rhetorical tool that Alul is probably, I mean, it's not dumb that he aligns himself with it. It makes sense given what he says in the rest of the book about Christianity and anarchy. Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, using it sort of in the rhetorical sense, I think it is extremely good to say, like, no, we reject power altogether. It's right. a pretty powerful statement. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's hard It's hard for me to read this anymore, even as someone who has, like, you know, gotten into Foucault in the sense yeah. that, like, power is way more complicated than what he's just said. So it's good rhetoric, maybe, but um, not a great analysis. Yeah, I would agree, especially with the Foucault bit, because... What I love about Foucault so much is he uh, he doesn't want to say that, oh, you should or shouldn't have power. He just says power is a thing in the world and you got to figure out how to relate to it and you have to figure out how it relates to you. And you just have to deal with that problem. So for Foucault, if you were looking at an anarchist collective, say, or an anarchist movement, the better question would be uh, where does power show up in this kind of situation as opposed to how it shows up in a different situation or a different configuration of social lives and people. And I think that is a more productive conversation to me because I feel like the minute you say you're against power, I'm always kind of looking for where power is secretly manifesting because you actually can't see it because you're not willing to admit that it's there. Yeah, I agree. Um, Also, I think that like most of the anarchists I know would probably say something similar. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Anarchist organizers obviously know this. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, there is a certain difference here between anarchists and Marxists uh, where for a good Marxist, it's all about taking power for sure. I mean, that's what you need to do. That's like the whole point. Yeah, there's a class war and right now some people have the power and it would be better if the other people did. Uh, And anarchists, like I just alluded to before, are nervous about that because they don't want those kinds of movements to turn into abuses of power. Yeah. Um, So, you know, there is something to be said there at least that Elul is kind of I think one way you can read this book is as Elul's attempt to distance himself on purpose from Marxist Christians. Yeah. I mean, it's written in the 80s, like Nicaragua already happened. Uh, all kinds of liberation theologians who are Marxists are writing and gaining popularity. And this is his way of maybe marking a distance there. And he's, I think that's like important to see that he does that with the power question. Yeah, I think so. Um, well, he says some other stuff about Marxists that we can probably touch on here. Yeah. He's got a lot of things to say about Marxists. <laughs> he does. Nothing very positive. Surprise. And mostly pretty silly. So I think kind of riffing off of this bit about power, we can uh, move to some of the stuff he says about Marxism. Yeah. Um, and get mad about it. Let's get mad. <laughs> okay, so towards the very end of the book, uh, the book is 105 pages long. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> Not very long. It's cool. The short books are good. They're my favorite kind of books. Not this one though. Uh, so on page one hundred four, he starts in and talks and start, starts making some concluding remarks about anarchism. Uh, he says, "Finally, anarchism can teach Christian thinkers to see the realities of our societies from a different standpoint than the dominant one of the state. What seems to be one of the disasters of our time is that we all appear to agree that the nation state is the norm. It is frightening to see that this has." Uh, that this has finally been stronger than the Marxist revolutions, which have all preserved a nationalist structure and a state government. Um, Skipping down just a little bit, he says, uh, whether the state be Marxist or capitalist, it makes no difference. The dominant ideology is that of sovereignty. This makes the construction of a united Europe laughable. No such Europe is possible so long as the states do not renounce their sovereignty. State nationalism has invaded the whole world. Thus, all the African peoples, when decolonized, rush to accept this form. Here's a lesson that anarchism can teach Christianity, and is a very good one. So, he's got a lot to say about the state there, and some things about Marxism that I find really strange. Yeah. And I think that we can map them onto the discussion of power uh, from the earlier bit in the book. Mm -hmm. So, okay, rejecting power is kind of like the point of anarchism, which I get. Um... But then the bit at the end about Marxism and like, you know, it doesn't really matter if you're a capitalist state or a Marxist state. It just like the state is just bad. I guess like in the way that he universally denies power, he's also universally denying the state. But Mm -hmm. this is such a silly kind of thing to do because, well, I mean, like those things are actually different and it does it does actually matter. And if it didn't, then maybe like why do capitalist countries care so much? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean. There's a point to be made about the fact that, yes, Marxist and capitalist states are still states and they still have 
certain monopolies on violence uh, and they exercise those monopolies at times that they think are relevant. So I can understand why any good faith anarchist would maybe sidle up to that. But also to suggest that there's no difference between those two things is just a very bad generalization and, and just a bad analytic. Like, uh, I mean, I know that there are loads of anarchists who would be like, yeah, I would hate living in a Marxist state as much as I would hate living in a capital state. But it's like, I'm sorry, you really wouldn't, though, materially, necessarily feel that way. I mean, maybe, but... I mean, even if they even if they hated both of them, like, fine. Yeah. You would notice that they are yeah, different yeah, yeah, yeah. in texture, yes, in feel. that's what I'm trying to say. In, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah, I get it. Um, I guess, like, what's frustrating is that the way he treats... Okay, so Alul is also a thinker of technology. Right. Um, other books, he, he wrote a book called The Technological Society. He talked. He wrote another book about the city. He's a person that thinks through things pretty deeply. Like, he thinks through things deeply, like, except politics. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, as a person who thinks about politics or uh, as technology, he's, like, pretty careful and, like, smart-ish. I mean, he's not the greatest in every single topic, but he kind of understands um, the ways that technology shaped culture. Um, but it's funny because he's treating, he treats politics in this way as sort of a neutral technology that is always Mm -hmm. one thing. Right. And it's such an uncareful analysis for someone who should not have an uncareful analysis. It's so weird. It is weird. Yeah. It's also weird because the the bit that he has to say about nationalism, uh, as it's tied up with liberation movements is complicated and the same kind of thing, right? That like okay, maybe it's good for people to have reservations about nationalism, and especially Christians. I mean, there are Christian reasons to not be a nationalist, for sure. I get that, and I'm sympathetic to that myself. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing I learned from that Cornell West essay that we talked about in the Opium of the People bit is that not all nationalisms are the same. Uh, (laughs) Nationalisms that serve as rallying points for colonized people in colonized nations are actually pretty good. Um, not that they're not open to their own abuses or anything like that, but I mean, it's important not to write everything off from a standpoint of just absolute purity or purity of ideology. Right. Um, I don't even remember what episode it is now. A few back, (laughs) many back, um, when we were talking about the Philippines though, and Christians for national liberation, right? I mean, they're Maoists and they take a different sort of approach to the nationalist question that like before you can deal with the sort of national bourgeoisie you have to kick out like the international bourgeoisie Mm -hmm. so you have to have a national identity and you have to be able to do that so like there are tactical reasons why that question of national nationalism is important Mm -hmm. um we're thinking through a little doesn't yeah and it's too bad that he as a french person also like craps on african people who are liberating themselves right like i don't know there's some not so latent uh colonial pathologies i think happening there so yeah um on that point we should we don't need to talk about it in depth but he also has a lot of sort of anti-islamic sentiment yeah um it's there there's a lot of very weird uh characteristically french problems in the rule um not that all french people have those problems obviously but like there are patterns and he's internalized them uncritically right i think so uh maybe one way that we can sort of keep pushing this a little bit more to talk about what he has to say about violence because i mean the sovereignty question and the question of power is also tied up with the question of violence and if you have a categorical rejection of those things then sure i mean i think that that's a bad way of thinking about it conceptually but it's not like it's inconsistent necessarily internally um but maybe we should look at how violence kind of plays into that constellation yeah um anarchists take up a lot of different positions on violence like antifa people i mean they they think the violence is good for defense and um you know some people don't there are like lots of currents within anarchism Mm -hmm. uh jacques lul says as much in the very beginning of the book on page 11 he says Mm -hmm. there are different forms of anarchy and different currents in it i must i must first say very simply what anarchy i have in view by anarchy i mean first an absolute rejection of violence hence i cannot accept either nihilists or anarchists who choose violence as a means of action I recall passing the Paris Bank some 20 years ago and saying to myself that a bomb ought to be placed under that building. It would not destroy capitalism, but it would serve as a symbol and a warning. Not knowing anyone who could make a bomb, I took no action. (laughs) That's the only reason. (laughs) How how could he do otherwise? Uh, Yeah, well, so... So, okay, in that all, we see a pretty particular type of anarchism kind of emerging. 
Um, one that's, I think, of a different texture than other types of anarchism. Um, the abs- So the, the basis of Alul's anarchism is an absolute rejection of violence. And from there, you can see sort of the coercive and violent nature of states and everything else. And that's right. why it's all bad. Okay, um, that's a pretty extreme position to take up. That's the that's actually the position. We'll talk about this later, but that's the position that really like was important to me when I liked it a little. Mm-hmm. But um, what always sticks out to me about this part is that he does recognize sort of like the violent urges and like kind of the um, maybe the utopianness of violence, um, and that's at least makes me feel like he is an authentic person. Like he's not yeah. being like. Uh, He's not being just like super a super pious Christian about his nonviolence. Like he recognizes the actual temptation and the the desire for it sometimes. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, and I think if you're, I think I said this in the first episode, or at least I've said it at some point. But if you're a pacifist and you're not tempted to blow up a bank, then like I'm sorry, your pacifism isn't worth that much. Yeah, uh, because when you really understand the violence of things like banks, uh, they, I mean, they impose themselves on you, right? Those understandings create sentiments and feelings that should make you upset and maybe upset enough to think that the only way you could ever get rid of a structure like that is to get rid of it like mm-hmm. physically materially so i appreciate that about a little i mean for all the things i don't necessarily like about him um that's that attention to ambiguity is something that i wish that he had in the rest of the book maybe that's a way of putting it yeah um but yeah I think this also speaks to the fact that his anarchism does come from his Christianity, and he's insistent on that, right? He thinks Christianity is nonviolent, therefore he's an anarchist, because anarchism is an opposition to violence. This podcast is going to get us on a list if it hasn't already. The only thing we like so far about Alul is that he's being real about wanting to blow up a bank. <laughs> That's right. All right, well. A list of good podcasts. Well, I mean, I, I guess it's not because he wants to blow up a bank. Right. That's why I like It's because it's like the one, like, semi-authentic part of the book yeah i agree i mean but maybe we could actually talk about that too right because in the same way that saying you're against power actually forecloses you to think about different arrangements of power when you're against violence it stops you from thinking really hard about violence so if the only reason you didn't blow up that bank is because you didn't know anyone who could make a bomb you're either lazy or bad at thinking about violence. This is the only two possibilities. You don't have a library card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, one way that Marxists talk about it, for example, is, yeah, like, sometimes it's a good idea to be violent. Mm-hmm. Not every time, though. Sometimes it's a good idea not to be violent. And it's important to think of that strategically and tactically. Ulul has this weird thing where he sometimes mentions that. He'll mention Gandhi or MLK or whoever, uh, and he'll be like, you know, tactically, strategically, they did the right thing, and that's why they won. Uh, but as lots and lots of really good theorists and good historians have shown, they would never have made those gains without the presence of concomitant violence uh, mm-hmm. next to them. You know, like, if you don't deal with a nonviolent threat, you'll have to deal with a violent threat, and that's the thing that states don't want to do, so they give in and compromise and meet halfway, right? Uh, so I think that being categorically against violence, even despite Alul's good moment of authenticity, actually stops him from thinking about uh, reasonable approaches uh, besides, like, I didn't know anybody who could make a bomb. Yeah, that's right. Huh. Really makes you think. It's making me think right now. (laughs) Okay, so so far we've been talking about some different ways that Alul relates to um, politics that, like, makes him stand out or makes him kind of similar to other anarchists um and okay he's kind of a weirdo right he's like not like <laughs> he's not the usual anarchist he's not like um i don't know the other folks we know he's not even like the classical sort of like bakunin or, right. or you know Cronon or whatever um so he uh he goes on in the book then uh, a little bit later on on page 34 to start talking about that great anarchist slogan that every teenager wrote on their binder, uh, no gods, no masters. <laughs> uh, I mean, they wrote it because it's cool. Um, XOXO. XOXO. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, so you'd think that like, um, I mean, most anarchists, uh, they reject all authority rather than just all violent authority or something like that. So um, a lot of anarchists are also atheists. Like those two things kind of seem to sit together pretty well. Yeah, if you don't like sovereignty, you definitely should not like God. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Alul goes through uh, some lengths to sort of clarify what God's sovereignty means and why that sovereignty is actually um, 
appropriate for uh, anarchists uh, who are Christians. And I, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so on that point of no gods, no masters, uh, Alul says, no matter what God's power may be, the first aspect of God is never that of the absolute master, the almighty. It is that of, it is that of the God who puts himself on our human level and limits himself. Uh, theologians who are under the influence of a monarchy, whether that of Rome or the 16th and 17th centuries, might have insisted on omnipotence by way of an imitation, but they did so by mistake. Sometimes, of course, when we have to oppose an all-powerful state, it is good that we should tell the dictator that God is more powerful than he is, that God is indeed the king of kings. Um, so that's a pretty interesting sort of way to think about God yeah. and sort of omnipotence. It's sort of like a way to like uh, possibly foreclose the imaginations of despots. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like mm-hmm. that a lot. Yeah, same. Um, so that's cool. That's also like an interesting way to think about the authority of God that um, God isn't just like sort of like that bearded dude in the cloud telling you what to do or something. God could be some some different sort of uh, entity that isn't sort of uh, an absolute figure in like a scary way. Yeah, and it's cool that reimagining political authority has consequences for your theology and vice versa. Uh, reimagining theological sovereignty would have hopefully consequences for what you think about politics. Yeah, I think so. Well, that's cool. So a little is good on that point. He definitely stands out from other anarchists then, if that's the case, because not many anarchists probably believe in God. But <laughs> um, here's another story that will maybe give us some more context to the type of anarchist that, <laughs> that Alul was. Okay, so this is actually pretty funny. Um, okay, so Alul is French, and all of the really cool stuff in France happened in 1968. Um, that's when the Situationists were sort of a group um that's when there are tons of uh student protests and a giant wildcat strike all kinds of really radical things were happening in 1968 uh and uh alul was alive and a part of it and let me tell you about it (laughs) okay um many things including contacts at that time with the spanish anarchists attracted me to anarchism but there was one insurmountable obstacle i was a christian I came up against this obstacle all my life. For instance, in 1964, I was attracted by a movement very close to anarchism, that is, situationism. I have very friendly contacts with Guy Debord, and one day I asked him bluntly whether I could join his movement and work with him. He said that he would ask his comrades. <laughs> their answer was frank. Since I was a Christian, I could not be <laughs> I can't belong to their movement. For my part, I could not renounce my faith. Reconciling the two things was not an easy matter. It was possible to conceive of being both a christian and a socialist there have been christian socialism for many years um but he couldn't uh he couldn't join the situationist so okay uh that's really funny it's very funny the situationists are extremely cool like in a in a classical cool sense yeah they're the, i mean gitabor was a filmmaker rule of anayim uh was like sort of a political theorist i mean they're they're all extremely cool people sunglasses leather jackets oh yeah i mean they stole art they uh held hostages it was great they were like some real weird (laughs) artsy fartsy outlaws uh but here's here's like the funny thing about it i mean so we've read uh this podcast some other stuff about paul virilio who is also a christian and also an anarchist um he didn't seem to have any problems with the situationists. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, they were cool with him hanging out. Yeah. Uh, there's, I mean, like, the Odeon Theater in 1968. Like, they were there. Yeah. Um, so we kind of got to read between the lines here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's funny because I guess there there are two ways I can think of this historically. This is pure speculation, but, I mean, there are only two ways. So it's got to be one of these two. <laughs> uh, the one is um, either Guy Debord was like, hey, um, I really don't want this guy to join, but like, I got to come up with a reason. And they're like, I don't know, just tell him it's because he's a Christian. Uh, okay, and then he did, and that's what happened. So it was a pretext for something else. Right. Uh, the other is that um, they wouldn't have let Virilio in either, but Virilio never asked because he's actually like too cool. So they were like, yeah, we'll hang because you're not, you're not desperate. Yeah, that's true. One of those two is, is definitely... I mean, like, first of all, how do you... You don't ask to become a part of the situation. <laughs> they're like, whatever, right? You just go. They're like in Oblivion when when something happens like he steals something and somebody shows up in the middle of the night and they're like you want to join the thieves guild or what <laughs> that's the situation uh that makes sense to me i do really like the fiction of um hey we can't we can't let him in <laughs> wait why well he's a giant nerd oh <laughs> uh, well are you gonna tell him that 
No, no, no. <laughs> it's weird to figure out why he would even want to join because he doesn't like violence. He doesn't like uh, a lot of things that the situation is like. Um, I don't know. It's it's hard to figure out that point of contact, I guess. Maybe the timeline is different. This is like 20 years after that, so maybe he just changed his mind, but strange. Yeah, it's true. It's sort of his recollection. Yeah. Well, anyways, that's very funny. <laughs> I want I want either of them to be true. They could both be true. They're not mutually exclusive. We'll never know. We won't. We could write a letter to Paul Virilio and ask. <laughs> Paul maybe Virilio. Yeah, maybe he knows. Some of the things that make Alula very weird um, are his sort of agricultural ideas. <laughs> uh, so That's one way of putting it. Yeah, that's one way to put it. Uh, okay, so Alul isn't a fan of the state because it's violent for some reason. Maybe we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, on page 15, Alul goes through this whole thing about how unnecessary he thinks the state is. And the way that this comes out, sort of the way that Alul relates how bad the state is to us, is talking about um, a friend of his who is a lawyer and also a, a mathematician and also an anarchist, or nearly so. I thought he was like a doctor for some reason. That's a great. doctor of law. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. I love this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love the story even more now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll just read this bit because it's so funny. I need to get it exactly right. Um, I don't want any fake news here. <laughs> uh, okay. A friend of mine, a doctor of law, a licentiate in mathematics, and an anarchist, or very nearly so, Decided on a real return to the land in uh, the harsh country of uh, France. He bred cattle for 10 years on the high plateau, but he objected. And this is the point of the story. Uh, he objected to the compulsory vaccination of his cattle against hoof and mouth disease, reckoning that if he raised them carefully and at a distance from any other herd, there was no danger of contracting the disease. This was when matters became interesting. Veterinary <laughs> officers went after him and imposed a fine. He took the case to court, giving proof of the incompetence and accidents connected with the vaccination. He lost at first, but on appeal, with the help of reports from biologists and eminent veterinarians, he was triumphantly acquitted. This is a very good example of the way in which we can find a little free space in the tangle of regulations, but we have to want to do it, not dispersing our energies, but attacking at a single point and winning by repulsing the administration and its rules. <laughs> All right, man. Like, just vaccinate your cat, your cows, though. <laughs> like, you don't. No one wants them to get hoof and mouth disease. Yeah. Well, it's weird because, on the one hand, you can understand the principle of the matter or something. Like, okay, my cows are never going to meet another cow. If we get it, we're not going to give it to them. I don't know. I, I don't know anything about cows. I don't know anything about biology. I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it's irrelevant. Maybe the vaccine is pointless. But also. <laughs> That is not a good analogy for thinking about organizing an anarchist society. I'm sorry, like, unless you want to go raise cattle on the top of a plateau, 15 cattle, and that is it, and it's just you, a doctor of law with no one else. Uh, and a mathematician. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Counting those cows. <laughs> it just seems so completely bonkers. Like, it's not a real political example. It's just like a weird story about a friend of his. Well, it's also, like, the worst example for anarchism because it's, like, um, instead of focusing on mutuality or, like, the community, you're like, but I want to raise these cows the way <laughs> I want to raise them. That's right. So, not great. It's a weird, like, libertarian argument. Yeah, it is. It's a really weird libertarian argument. Like, it's, like, what I would expect from, like, the the right in the United States. Yeah, like, I know there's a Cato Institute post about how, like, a guy's lawyer friend has a bunch of cows and they've never been vaccinated and everything's fine. Yeah yeah that sounds right i don't know it's just such a weird point to make yeah um it doesn't seem like a great idea to me <laughs> but i don't all, all i know like what do i know i'm just a violent marxist that wants to vaccinate your cows <laughs> i just want your cows to be healthy that's right that's just want your cows to be healthy that's the model of the revolution <laughs> um i mean i can understand one point that he's making where he's just trying to say sometimes laws are not applicable in a certain situation but they'll hound you for them anyway and it's like well yeah but that's that's why you go to court. Like the the lawyer went to court and then he lost and then he appealed and then he won. So seems like it worked out, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Extremely legal situation here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it's a really good example of how the law actually works. <laughs> Thanks for convincing me. You did it, a little. You, you good liberal. <laughs> you good liberal. <laughs> okay. Well. Okay, so we've established that Alul is a weird anarchist. Um, he obviously is an anarchist in some ways. 
but uh, in the way that I'm about to explain to you, he is not an anarchist. <laughs> okay, this is where things get really weird, uh, I think, in the book. Uh, okay, so so Alul says this. The true anarchist thinks that an anarchist society with no state, no organization, no hierarchy, and no authorities is possible, livable, and practicable. But I do not. <laughs> in other words, in other words, I believe that the anarchist fight and struggle for an anarchist society is essential. But I also think that uh, the realizing of such a society is impossible. Um, so that's kind of weird. I mean, I guess it makes a little bit of sense if you think about it. But it's also really strange. Like, yeah. Um, okay, I mean, like, is an anarchist society really possible? I don't know. Maybe not. But the struggle is a good one, right? Like, the process of getting there is great. Yeah. That makes sense. But why not just say that you believe in an anarchist? Like, why why would you struggle for something that you don't think is going to happen or you don't even think is, like, something that you want? Yeah. Uh, it's just a strange kind of defeatism. I mean, I, I get keeping the horizons of, like, the revolution open or yeah. something. But you do that in such a way that you commit to that revolution without being like, we'll never, ever get there. Uh it's just a weird thing to say the difference between me and anarchists, other anarchists, is that they believe in it and I actually don't. Yeah, it is kind of like a weird disavowal, right? Where yeah. he can keep it at an arm's length and doesn't have to commit too hard. It, this whole book seems like an apology for not committing. In mm-hmm. a way. I think that you're right, yeah. <laughs> not... It's like, here are Christian reasons you shouldn't really be an anarchist. Here are some <laughs> other reasons you shouldn't really be an anarchist. Yeah, exactly. It's really strange. It's just like he wants you... I mean, if he just wants you to be a pacifist and like a libertarian, maybe that's what we should argue for. <laughs> yeah, <And> he does. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, it's weird too, though, because he mentions that there are cool Christians historically. Uh, so a little, in addition to thinking about technology and all theology and all this other stuff, he also did a lot of work in history and medieval history in particular. And he has this weird moment where he like talks about early christian movements and their participation in liberation struggles uh i don't really remember the details of that maybe you have it handy there matt has the ics copy of this book and i do not so <laughs> i got it all over here i'm hoarding the knowledge <laughs> yeah there are some cool things um or some other cool connections that alul draws out between anarchists and christians uh he says um in the 14th and 15th centuries in most of the peasant revolts the clergy marched with their parishioners as revolutionaries and often headed headed the uprisings but the usual outcome was a massacre like that's awesome <laughs> that's like a super yeah. cool story i'd love to know more about that yeah um that's a really neat thing um it's weird that like a little would think about that in any kind of positive way since it's an uprising and it's yeah. actually violent like it's you think that would kind of discount it for him but well i think the the moral of the story is in the very end right they mm. all end in massacre yeah good point uh which is a weird thing like you bring it up because it's kind of exciting and then you immediately put it back down <laughs> yeah So then it goes on a little bit differently, though, after that. He says, we have to ask whether things became any different under democratic systems, uh, much less than one might think. The central thought is still that power is from God, hence the democratic state is also from God. The odd thing is that this was an old idea from the 9th century. Some theologians had stated that all power is from God through the people. Plainly, however, this did not lead directly to democracy. In, quote, Christian democracies, we find a similar alliance to to that already described, except that the church now has fewer advantages. Um, so there's a weird thing going on here, too, where God is, respons- is responsible for democracy. <laughs> what do we make of that? Yeah. Uh, well, but he, he says that... Uh, some theologians argue that God is God, the sovereignty of God is through the people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be democratic, um, or at least the way that democracies developed are not in keeping with that idea per se. Um, I mean, I think that's actually a, a pretty cool point about political economy and the history of political theology. And there's a lot of good research on that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's hard to know exactly where he's going with it. Like, is he trying to say that that impulse is exactly right? And maybe you could have a more radical democracy informed by a real critique of theological sovereignty. Or is he trying to say that this was a weird thing that licensed something that was actually bad and then people forgot how intense it was. It's not totally clear to me. Yeah. And he kind of just drops it right after that too. It's not like he elaborates. Right. It does kind of give me the feeling that like, it's kind of a quick, like kind of a Quaker idea a little bit. Like, yeah. Um, that they practice our type of radical democracy within right. their religious practice. So 
and, and it's like cool. and it's uh supported by the holy spirit so that's kind of a cool thing mm-hmm. i don't know i like that i'm not sure if that's yeah. what lul's saying but i'm yeah. saying that's what i like <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> he's a calvinist so yeah knows. probably not <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so i don't know and also it just makes me think about his comments about other revolutionary christians just in general um there's some stuff he says about Nicaragua, which is pretty lame, uh, and he's extremely anti-communist. Like, he blames... <laughs> There's a point in the book, we don't have to find it, but he blames, like, uh, Catholic priests in Nicaragua for putting theology in the service of the communist regime. And that's, like, an extremely bad way of understanding that whole situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> theologians were arguing for a, a Marxist politics, specifically because they were theologians, but... Anyway, maybe we could talk about what he has to say about liberation theology generally, because there's a pretty weird moment in the book where he says that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so he says, uh, this is on page five, so skip it way back to the very beginning. Um, he says, in the 1970s, we saw the same tendency in the so-called liberation theologies, and an extreme form of strategy has been found to make possible association with South American revolutionary movements. A poor person of any kind is supposedly identical with Jesus Christ. Hence, there's no problem. For the event 2,000 years ago, little attention is paid to it. Uh, these orientations were broadly preceded by that of rationalistic Protestantism around 1900 with its simple presupposition that since science is always right and has the truth, then in preserving the Bible and the gospel, we must abandon everything that is contrary to science and reason. For example, <laughs> the possibility that God incarnated himself in a man along along with the miracles of the resurrection, etc. This is some really weird uh, stuff Yeah. here. Like, so, okay, I was asking you about this before we started recording, Dean, and what you told me was the whole point of this is that, like, he's mad that, like, that liberation theology just reduces Jesus to being, like, a poor person rather than being something, like, particular, right? Yeah, or that uh, for liberation theology, Jesus shows up in poor people uh, and is is manifested in in the poor as opposed to this kind of i think is where he comes stems from carl bart he mentions that in the book Mm -hmm. uh bart has this worry that people just forget that actually god became a human being and that was like a really radical event the most radical event that's ever happened and that specificity and particularity is lost for a little when you start insisting on jesus being present ubiquitously throughout the oppressed I just think that is the dumbest, most pedantic criticism. And it's so weird that he links it to liberal Protestantism mm-hmm. as well. Uh, this might also betray some of his colonialist problems because yeah. that's like a very, very European way of thinking about movements that happened in Latin America to decolonize those places. Um, I mean, it, they were so thickly Catholic and in that way so thickly incarnational and mm-hmm. not very thickly liberal or thickly Protestant. Yeah, so it's just right. a, a really weird, weird way of reading that whole situation. Yeah, it's. I mean, this is not the first time we've come across this type of critique of liberation theology in this podcast. Like people, I mean, people say this to us on Twitter. Yeah, it's Not true. in real life. No one would ever say it to us in real life. <laughs> Twitter faces. But on Twitter, people say it all the time. And yeah. I don't really understand it still. Like, I still understand this critique because it's like, why not both? Like, yeah. it could just be both. Yeah. There's like, nothing... maybe Jesus incarnated and that was a big deal. And, like, also maybe Jesus is present in the poor. And that's also a big deal. Like, yeah. it just doesn't, they're not mutually exclusive. Like, one doesn't mean the other can't happen. Yeah. It's just weird. Also, to insist on the Protestant concern here that Alul has, not the Protestant concern as other than the one, but Alul's <laughs> Protestant concern, uh, that, like, Jesus gets forgotten in light of putting jesus into the face of all the people that you think about and care about every day is just totally strange i mean it doesn't seem to make any sense and it also seems extremely bourgeois everything about it is i don't know pretty uh, bourgeois gross to me oh uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah well weird so i don't know uh the thing i keep coming back to about alul um man i just don't really get the the complete rejection of the state like that's just something that does not make sense to me um yeah. I guess because I'm a Marxist, that's why it doesn't make sense. <laughs> I mean, um, states can be bad, but they can also be good. It's true. <laughs> Anarchist collectives can be bad and can be good. Yeah, totally. They they can absolutely. Um, there are particularities of those situations that don't make them universally bad or good. Yeah. Um, has a lot to do with other things too, like composition and whatever. But uh, I guess I guess like what's weird to me about anarchism um, is. I guess like just the sweeping claims it makes about the state, like uh, like that state power is always violent or it's always coercive. I don't understand why that's the case. Like, mm. are building streets coercive? 
Yeah, it's a good question. I think in some cases, probably yes. In some cases, they are coercive. Yeah. Uh, I could see a situation where that could be the case. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think you're right that uh, even if it is coercive, it's not necessarily bad, first of all. And secondly, sometimes it's not coercive. Sometimes it's just some state needs to do because it funnels a lot of money into public projects right yeah i guess like i don't know coercion doesn't always seem like the worst thing to me getting people to do the things you need them to do yeah this goes back to a thing we often talk about on the podcast is people just uh often in especially in western societies will refer to some concepts as though they're just obviously bad there's mm-hmm. no way they could be good um violence is one of them coercion is one of them I get it. It makes sense. I mean, I don't want people to do violence to me or do violence against me. I wouldn't say that. And I don't really want to do violence to other people. But at the same time, I can understand where some violences are understandable and not necessarily bad, right? They're part of a a good project. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. Sometimes, like, I've said this on the podcast too, but you can understand Martin Luther King Jr. as being extremely violent in a lot of situations right um it's very violent if you're a white supremacist to have somebody going around ruining your entire way of life uh just because the tactics are one way or another doesn't make them non-violent per mm-hmm. se. yeah or that like you can use a rhetoric of non-violence and like you should yeah but still like you know in- inflict a type of economic violence against somebody yeah and it goes that's the same with the state yeah there are state things that are violent and good and state things that are violent and bad and then probably state things that are not violent and good and state things that are not violent and bad (laughs) those are the four categories those are the four genders of states (laughs) yeah i mean that makes sense to me i guess yeah and i don't know it just seems like that's the scope of possibility like it could be good or bad yeah i mean it just like i guess the the anarchist response i suppose would just be like but yeah but states are like more like have more potential to be to be bad yeah that's how i always hear it is they're inclined in a certain direction right they're inclined toward corruption or toward devolving into the oppressors that they themselves replaced just seems like a design problem to me yeah i agree well make a better state yeah i mean the state (laughs) 2.0 the issue for me is always that um Anarchists suffer from all the same problems. Yeah. I mean, I've been around enough anarchists to understand that, like, organizing people to live in an anarchist community can be actually extremely unhealthy and destructive and create problems that are not good. Mm-hmm. And there, I mean, I guess it's probably true that a small anarchist collective would never inflict, like, the, the scale or gravity of violence as, like, a massive state or something like that, but... I don't know. The problem of violence is not the thing that's being solved. It's the problem of scale, I guess, at that point. Yeah. <laughs> Just get your cows. Just get those cows, get on the top of that hill, and do not put a vaccine in them. <laughs> that's right. No vaccinations there. <laughs> well, okay. So at the beginning of this episode, we started talking about um, sort of the impact that Alul had in our lives. Um, so what, now that it's the end of the episode, <laughs> what impact did Alul have in your life? Yeah, uh, so it's true. I was opened up to thinking about uh, kind of radical Christian politics by Jacques Ellul and a few others. And for that, I am grateful, I guess. Uh, I think when I first read this book, I was an impressionable like 18 or 19 year old or something like that. And at that time, it was not clear to me what I even thought about politics. So he gave me a language and some conceptual tools and I ran with those, right? So that's cool. And there are also ways that Elul appeals to some Christian sensibilities that are probably really still really good gateways for Mm -hmm. people to kind of transition or make an exit out of evangelicalism or things like that. And that's cool. I guess what he means for me today is uh, he like marks a distance that I've traveled. Yeah. Um, There was a time that I would have agreed with everything in this book. And now I disagree with the majority of it. And uh, I couldn't have gotten there without going through it or passing through that gate or something like that. So I can't like hate it and I don't hate it, Um, but I don't identify with it as one time in my life. I would have very strongly identified with it. Yeah. um, No, I think I'm in the same boat. I remember. So this is uh, this is the story I think I've told on the podcast probably more than one time. But um, I remember reading. So I read this book for the first time in a political philosophy class. And it was like, we had to, we just had to read any kind of book of political philosophy and write something about it. Mm. And I wanted to pick something really weird. Um, 
So I like found, I found it. I did. <laughs> and it was really funny because I think that, I mean, going through that class, I would like, um, you know, we'd like read Rousseau and I'm like, yeah, I'm a classical liberal now. <laughs> and, we'd, and then we'd read like some kind of like, like actual liberal. I'm like, oh yeah, liberalism is good. And then like I got this and I was like, well, this is good. This is actually good. <laughs> um, just like, I mean, yeah, being impressionable and being like 19 and being like sort of a philosophy major. It's just like, mm. you have to pick, I mean, for me at least, you have to keep picking the most like <laughs> radical and alienating things, all your friends, or else it's not really that cool. Yeah, that's right. Um, but yeah, there definitely was a time when I like read this book and I was like, "This is one hundred percent great." I think Dave's right. Um, it's it's all cool. There's a part of this book too that's more of an exegesis of some Old Testament mm-hmm. themes, and I think that's still actually pretty worthwhile. Yeah, that's right. Actually, um, that's better than the first part of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it does definitely mark a distance, um, a place where I started and now don't identify with it all. <laughs> Uh, I will say, reading this, we already alluded to this earlier, but it does actually genuinely make me more thankful for other kinds of Christian anarchists. Yeah. I think there was a time that I felt this is the only way you could do it. Like, uh-huh. this is what it meant to be a Christian anarchist. And I so appreciate having people like Catherine, who's been on our podcast and who hosts the podcast Friendly Anarchism. Uh, I mean, she, she I, I would say she has some similar hangups as a little, just, I, I don't think that's offensive for her to hear me say that. <laughs> uh, I mean, she thinks I've got a lot of bad marks to hang up to, and that's cool. Uh, but I think that she's, like, infinitely more authentic than Alula yeah. is. I mean, she's living it out, and she's organizing with anti-fascists, and she's not intimidated by building coalitions with people over the tendencies and mm-hmm. other kinds of Christians. Um, I feel the same way about, like, people like Sung, who's yeah. organizing that Friendly Fire Collective. Like, it's extremely open to a variety of leftist tendencies, even though he's an anarchist and all the... Uh, uh sort of symbolism and the images are anarchists like that's a really neat thing i, I appreciate that there are better christian anarchists than jock Lule. yeah i know um <laughs> i agree yeah it's funny um i mean the guy who wrote the book on christianity and anarchism is actually not as good as people who have not written the book on it <laughs> and they should they should <laughs> i'd read that book <laughs> yeah so that's cool um, I'm still a Marxist, I guess, and still still seeing Jesus and the poor. Not too concerned about getting my hands ringing about uh, whether or not people are obsessed with like the last few chapters of the Gospels or something. But yeah, I don't know. He he's not the worst person, but he's increasingly not the best. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, um, if you know any impressionable young <laughs> people that need a good book, I guess give them this and see what happens. <laughs> That's right. See what happens. Yeah, it's a good way in. Yeah, I think so. But then give them a different book. <laughs> Keep buy all young people <laughs> books. That's my platform. That's a good one. I'll elect you on that platform. Yeah, it's a socialist policy. Vote for me. Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. Um, if you haven't already, definitely subscribe to us on iTunes. Uh, leave us a review because that helps us do something on iTunes. I don't really know how it works. Um, the more reviews we get, the more chance we have of usurping Joel Osteen from his throne. Hey, let's take a special moment here at the end of the episode to also recognize that uh, my uh, pastor, Mark Driscoll, uh, my pastor, has blocked us on Twitter. <laughs> and Mark, if you could, please unblock us. I have something really important to tell you. Just I, I'm only going to tell you on Twitter. So just, Mark, I know you're listening. Please unblock us. Okay. Yeah. Also, uh, we're not we're not tithing Patreon money until we're unblocked. That's right. <laughs> Mark doesn't really get important. any more of our money. Ten percent of our Patreon money uh, has never gone to Mark Driscoll, but it definitely <laughs> will not while we're blocked. I think that should be clear. That's right. So you can get involved in Magnificast if you tweet at Mark Driscoll and tell him to unblock us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also works with Roger. Ayer. Yeah, Roger is fine too. Any of them. <laughs> Uh, another thing about reviews, though, um, if you can't kick us money towards the Patreon, which is totally cool and fine, uh, a really good way to support us and help us out is to do the iTunes review. It's free. It's, it's fun. We'll read it on the, on the show and make one or two jokes, depending on how That's funny it. we are no, that one, day. One or two, but no more. Yeah, one or two. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, uh, The Magnificast. Find us on Twitter, The Magnificast. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. You should definitely do that. Uh, like our page on Facebook. I think I said that one. That's good. Uh, also, check out the Magnificast basement to get in on all of the cool conversations that are going on there. Um, people are posting a lot there these days, and I can't even keep up, but you get a lot of good uh, stuff. So check it all out. All right, cool. See you next time. I don't want to get up the
church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord.